One, I'm sorry. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. To him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Welcome, everybody. I was just um, starting to explain that there, uh, what we're doing is we're going to be looking at what actually trying to prove what Bhante is basically saying. When he says to you, uh, whenever a hindrance comes up, it's because you broke a precept. And he does say to you that, you know, this precept could have been in this lifetime very recently or earlier, or even in a previous lifetime when the fruition comes over and the energy of the, the fruit of the action from before is the power, the energy is the power that pushes the uh, wheel of samsara. So you see the motion of that when we learned Dhamma, uh, the, the, the dependent origination, we learned actually the steps where it starts to move and push further and harder along from the point of contact, then feeling, then craving, and then clinging, habitual tendency and the birth of the reaction. And we're going over one piece at a time now, and we've gone through the contact and the craving and the, the feeling and the craving and the clinging and the uh, habitual tendency. Now we're going to go next time into the, the birth of the reaction. And that's going to be when I get to Mumbai. So a little bit of news. I'm leaving here to move from Goa to back to Mumbai. And it, it, I don't know what I'm walking into, which is very normal for monks and nuns. <laughs> we never know what we're actually walking into, unless we have pictures or we've been there before. So I'm, I'm hoping I, when I get there, I can go right into the unit I'm staying in, but possibly I will be staying in a very safe place attached to a, per, a person's house that there's a private room they keep for me there. So I can go to that part of the city sometimes for blessings with people and like that. So uh, that little room is there and it's safe and I can go there if I need to for a few days before I go into the other situation. Now I gave you a paper tonight, but we're not going to fool around with the paper. We're actually just going to go right through uh, this um, sutta that I found. And it's rather fun because um, I have to get the page up for you. Whoops, there we go. Let's see if I can do it. Well, there, why is it doing that? There, I'll come back to you in a second. Oh, fudge, fiddle dee, fiddle dee dee. Here, if you wanted to uh, address her. I can't do it. Okay, if you can put it up, it's going to be better. Now I have to find out how to get you back. I can't find you. Uh, there you go. I love it. There's four or five different ways, you know, to come back from that uh, screen to where you all are. Dante, if you put the paper on the screen. Well, if I do it, I have to disconnect the mic and hook up the, and do a whole bunch of stuff. Can you do it? One second. Uh, Deepa is here, you wanted to address her, no something? Uh, okay, well, Deepa's here. Okay, all right. Yes. So what I was saying to them a little bit ago was you asked a question last week, and then it set me off for the week. This is what I really like, by the way. If you send questions in and one of them just goes, dig, dig, then I can start searching and find stuff to give you really good answers, you know? 
Um, and so this whole page that I sent to you came out of this trotting through the book. And I even have a bone to pick with Bhikkhu Bodhi after doing this. I want to write him a letter because I think very strongly that this particular sutta that we're going to look at tonight, it should be listed under virtue or it could also be listed under, um, I guess it's hindrances. And always remember, I've, I, I don't know if I was the only one that, who was dumb, but I spent one time over, over an hour hunting for the precepts in the index of the Majima Nikaya. And there is nothing under precepts. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with this picture? <laughs> and finally, we were sitting at the table, saw a couple other people, and the three, between the three of us, we finally figured out that it, it was about um, not behavior, not discipline, not precepts uh, or commandments. It certainly wasn't commandments, you know. It turns out the precepts are listed under virtue in the index. And it's just an old word. It's not a word my children would even think of. That's the same thing as a precept. And I'm wondering if anybody realizes that. But there were not very many uh, things listed under there. And you had to go and dig for this. So the sections I pulled out for you guys to examine yourselves as you play with this to see what he's doing. But what he does, the way that you prove this, how do you prove that Bonte's saying that of the teaching than just the precepts and just the hindrances? You have to go into the text themselves to understand how he is, the Buddha is presenting this situation which guarantees that he's telling you the right thing. So let's just go into the sutta. It's number 54, and it's called the, the Pataliya Sutta. And it's to Pataliya, who was a householder, and the Buddha is going to teach him. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the country of the Anguttarapans where there was a town of theirs that was named Apana. And when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went to Apana for alms. And when he had wandered for alms in Apana and had returned from his alms realm, after his meal, he went to a certain grove for the days abiding. And having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree. Now Pataliya, the householder, was walking and wandering for exercise, wearing full dress with a parasol and sandals, and also went to the grove. And having entered the grove, he went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. And with this courteous and amiable talk, when it was finished, he stood at one side, and the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. When this was said, the householder Potalia, he thought the recluse Gotama addresses me as householder and angry and displeased, he remained silent. A second time, the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. And a second time, the householder Potalia thought, the recluse Gotama addresses me as a householder and angry and displeased, he remained silent again. A third time, the blessed one said to him, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. And when this was said, the householder Pataliya thought, well, the recluse Gotama addresses me as householder and angry and displeased as he was, he said to the blessed one, Master Gotama, it is neither fitting nor proper that you should address me as householder. Householder, you have the aspects, the marks, and the signs of a householder. Nevertheless, Master Gotama, I have given up all my works and cut off all my affairs. In what way, householder, have you given up all your works and cut off all your affairs? Master Gautama, I have given all my wealth 
and grain and silver and gold to my children as their inheritance. I do not advise or blame them about such matters, but merely live on food and clothing. And that is how I have given up all my works and cut off all my affairs. Householder, the cutting off of affairs as you describe it is one thing, but in the noble one's discipline, the cutting off of affairs is different. What is the cutting off of affairs? Like in the noble one's discipline, venerable sir. Well, it, it would be good, venerable sir, if the blessed one would teach me the Dhamma, showing me what the cutting off of affairs is like in the noble one's discipline. Then listen, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say to you. Yes, venerable sir, Patalia the householder replied, and the blessed one said this, householder, there are these eight things in the noble one's discipline that lead to the cutting off of affairs. And what are those eight? With the support of the non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. With the support of taking only what is freely given, the taking of what is not given is abandoned. With the support of truthful speech, false speech is to be abandoned. With the support of malicious speech, malicious speech is to be abandoned. With the support of no rapacity and greed, lust and greed, Lust and greed are to be abandoned, and with the support of no spite and scolding, spite and scolding are to be abandoned. And with the support of no anger and irritation, anger and irritation are to be abandoned. And with the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. The these are the eight things stated in brief without being expounded upon in detail that lead to the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline. Venerable sir, uh, it would be good if out of compassion the blessed one would expound for me the detail of these eight things and lead to the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline which have been stated in brief by you without being expounded on in detail. Well then listen, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, Potalia, the householder replied, and he listened as the blessed one said this. With the support of non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, here a noble disciple considers thus, I am practicing the way to be to, to, be, to the abandoning and the cutting off of the, those fetters because of which I might kill living beings. And if I were to kill living beings, I would blame myself for doing so. The wise have investigated and would censure me for doing so. And on the dissolution of the body after death, because of killing living beings, an unhappy destination would be expected. But this killing of living beings is itself a fetter, a hindrance. And while taints and vexation and fever might arise through the killing of living beings, there are no taints, vexation, and fever for one who abstains from the killing of living beings. And so it was in reference to this that it was said, with the support of non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. And then with the support of taking only what is not given, I'm sorry, only what is freely given. The taking of what is not given is to be abandoned. 
so it was said. And with the reference to what was this said, here, noble disciple considers thus, I am practicing the way of abandoning, oh dear, taking what is not given. I love the switchbacks. <laughs> here, the noble disciple considers thus, I am practicing the way to, uh, to the ab abandoning and cutting off of those fetters because of which I might Mm -hmm. Right. Take what is not freely given. This is where you have to substitute everything you say. I love it. I didn't write it out for you. And um, banning, okay, cutting off fetters, I might lose. If I were to take what is not freely given, I would blame myself for doing so. The wise have investigated and would censure me for doing so. And on the dissolution of the body after death because of taking what is not freely given, living beings would go to an unhappy destination and this would be expected. But this taking of what is not freely given is in itself a fetter and a hindrance. And while the taints and vexation and fever might arise through taking what is not freely given, there are no taints in vexation and fever for one who abstains from taking what is not freely given. You feel good when you don't take something from someone else. How do you feel when you have something stolen from you or you steal from somebody? Did you just able to walk away from it, go to work, feel fine, and not have any repercussions? When you look at the chart I gave you, the five, pre the five hindrances are obvious. And when we steal something, there's a residual there that comes back on us right away with uh, feeling you, you committed lust and greed if you stole something, right? You could have also committed hatred and aversion against someone in the process of doing that. And you look at these hindrances, you say, what did I do that I know is wrong? What, what did I break in the precepts? But also you look at the, the hindrances immediately and you say to yourself, what's coming up for me? You see? And with the hindrances sitting there, what's happening for you is happening as a result of breaking that precepts. So you see your hindrances and the hatred and aversion, then the sloth and torpor shows up at work, the sleepy dull mind, the restlessness and guilt and remorse show up about what I said to someone, how I treated them, how I behaved. And these things are remarkable. And then the restlessness part is just wonderful because I can measure a situation of ethnics and morality in a given area by going to a coffee shop. I discovered this, it's very interesting. So if you go to a coffee shop at the time in the afternoon that everybody's getting off the business and they're going to get their coffee before they go home. It's the men, it's so mar largely the men, but you can catch women with this too. And if they're sitting there with their knee going like this and bouncing it, something's wrong. This isn't normal. And I, this one man said, oh, I'm a Sri Lankan, we all do this. And I'm there, no, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You know, every time you sit, you bounce your knee. You broke a precept, and if you look at the list of precepts, you can pin down what it was. It may have only been cleaning the ants in the counter by killing all of them, and you never did it that way before. Usually you dust them into a dustpan and put them out the door, and you feel so bad you can't stay still in your meditation, you're moving, you see? So this movement is this restlessness coming out of the body. It comes out in your walk, comes out when you're waiting to cross the street, comes out when you're definitely, when you're sitting there having a cup of coffee. I went to one place and there were nobody in the place was, their knees were bouncing. I was amazed. I went to another place near the heart of the financial district in a large, comp a large city. And almost everybody's knee was bouncing. <laughs> I don't know what the occupations were. I don't know what was happening, but it was very funny. And then you would go to another area in the country. Everybody's very laid back and they're still, and they've got their cup of coffee and they're just relaxing, you know. 
It's very different. So there really is something to that. And then with the support of truthful speech, false speech is to be abandoned. And the false speech, so it was said, if with the support of, um, okay, then so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, well, here a noble disciple considering thus, I am practicing the way of uh, abandoning uh, false speech and cutting it off as if it were a fetter because of which I might, uh, I might tell a false thing. I might say an untruth, tell an untruth. And if I were to um, continue to tell false, commit false speech, I would blame myself for doing so. Have you ever lied? Have you ever been starting to pass around gossip? Have you ever done that? And how do you feel when you realize this, the, the reverberation of this? Have you seen the people suffer in the office if you try slander and try to get a job by saying something bad about somebody else so they can't get the job? And how can you even work that it doesn't creep up on you? And if we don't see it in the office, your wife or your husband is gonna see it at home because you won't be able to sleep and you'll be restless in the morning and it all trickles out. We're not built to cheat, we're not. It's not, it's just that way. Now, with the support of unmalicious speech, malicious speech is abandoned. So you make sure the malicious speech is um, rough speech, you know, cursing and things like that. And it's the malicious speech and also the malicious speech is slander. So you have two pieces here. You have malicious speech. Uh, gossip is telling stories about someone and they're not there to defend themselves. And you don't even know if it's true because somebody told you and you pass it along. And there's people who live for this, a cup of coffee and a bunch of gossip, and they don't even think about the damage it does. Because they don't even know if they heard something just very juicy, they'll say. And did you hear about this? You know, I, dear me, that's not good. <laughs> but with the, with the support of the Lust and greed, lust and greed will be abandoned. No a lust and greed, then the lust and greed will be abandoned. So what is he talking about? He's constantly, consistently through the text. If you go back to number two, or you go back to number four in the Majima Nikaya, they're talking about replacing whatever it is with the opposite, you see, in those two suttas. And they're talking about... Um, how to remember that what you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. This is from another sutta. So you build your structure. And what do we know about our practice? We're, we're all meditators here. We know that if we start breaking the precepts and turning them around, that it comes out that we can't go any further than a certain point in our practice. The blockade comes up. A wall will come right up in front of you. You'll go right into a wall. I've seen it happen. If with the support of no spite and scolding, spite is really hyper-criticizing a person or putting them down as useless and things like that, and scolding is just scolding, scolding, scolding them to the point where they don't think they can do anything right. And this is the worst kind of thing that can happen to a person in a job and you wanna run away from it. Like the woman I told you about in the office and I promised you we would get to the, the answer to that in the next Wednesday that we had, you know, what happened to her in the office when the boss came in every Monday morning and just stood there and spited her and scolded her, but for something that wasn't even really her fault. And we've been through things like that. The next one is no anger or irritation the irritation would be abandoned if we chose no anger and irritation. No matter what, well, how do we tell you to do this? Forgive it right in its face. The moment it happens, just forgive it. And then let it go, relax, smile, and come back. That's what we say, just forgive it. And the question, some person came right in my face once and said, why should I do that? 
and I looked at him and I just went, you know, why not? <laughs> it's the question. Why not do it? You look at this world and you say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Nothing I can do about this world. But what would happen if a whole town just decided to say, well, I forgive you. You know, it's all right. You're having a bad day. You must be having a bad day. I have bad days and good days. Everybody has bad days and good days. Can't you do that with a person? You have to understand when you people are actually in training, you are building a trained mind. And you have gotten also into places where many monks probably don't get in their whole time they're training. They don't get this close to it. When we take you into those seven links and show you how to watch phenomena arise and how does it disappear and how does it work that this gratification happens where I get personally involved in it because you're taking a personal perspective of everything and you think everything's about me and it's mine and it's myself. It's who I am. It goes that far. And so you live on the defensive and you fear everything and you're afraid of going in front of people. You're afraid of, you might make a mistake. You're afraid of everything. How does that happen? How does it happen? Because you don't know how it works. But once you understand for one thing, if someone's putting you down and, um, you know, really coming down on you hard, it's probably because they've had a really bad day. Can we say that and try that approach first? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am. But I've seen some ridiculous things where people were really going to come after me and I turned around and basically offered them a donut <laughs> or really just smiled and said, you know, remarked on how ridiculous this whole day is with the train not running or the lights going out or the phones not working in the terminals and things like this. And if you start laughing or smiling, it starts to shine a different kind of energy and people around you start picking it up, you see? So anger and irritation doesn't go anywhere except getting you exhausted. Support non-arrogance. The arrogance is to be abandoned. That's fun. I, I sometimes think I, I don't know what I look like. I don't, I, and somebody said, why don't you know what you look like? Well, because I lived seven years without a mirror. <laughs> I didn't have a mirror. And only time it was there is if I went down the mountain and in the old house, then it was there. But it wasn't there. And it was covered up in the bathroom and in the trailer. I didn't know when I got old. I couldn't figure it out. I think the first time I realized I am old. There you go. I am old. Okay. Was when I got to Goa. <laughs> And I got off the plane and these medical doctors were waiting there to test people. And it was the last plane in Dagoa. And the Germans, they were lining them up and trying to figure out if they were going to send them to a hospital or not. And Bonte and I were the last two. And when the woman had separated us and told us to sit and wait because we were the, the elders, you see. And they came over and stood in front of us and they had our little papers from the plane and there wasn't anything wrong with what we said on the papers. We don't have any conditions. We don't have anything serious going on, see? And then she looked at both of us and I said, why is it you want us to go to a hospital? We're not going to a hospital. And they said, well, you see, you, you, she just said it very calmly. You see, uh, you have a condition. You do have a condition. Bonte was sitting upright in the chair at that time in the, in the wheelchair and I was sitting in the chair and I watched him out the corner of my eye and it was rather, you know, we, we've neither of us ever, ever had anybody say anything like this to us, you know, and, um, and the woman says, you both have a condition. I said, what condition? You're old. I thought to myself, <laughs> I said, nobody's ever told me I have a condition because I'm old. Come on. What's this about? How can you, how can you tell me something like that? So what happened was I looked out the corner of my eye and just for a split second, I noticed that um, Monty did something real interesting. <laughs> it's right here in this text. 
I can read it to you. I think Brenda will get a kick out of this a little bit. Basically what happened was when this was said, my teacher sat there and sat silent, dismayed with shoulders drooping, his head down, glum, without response. Just like, ugh, like that. From here to just, ugh. You know, it was like being punched in the gut. And we're both there, we no, nothing's changed. We're, just, we're both there. And that was what happened. And of course it didn't, it just sort of flew right through him. And I didn't quite know what to say back again, except I said, let me show you something. And I pulled out a copy of the set six or seven retreats that we just did in the talks and everything and three months of work. And I said, look, we've been in quarantine for three months. <laughs> Every retreat we go to, people come in and we're there for 10 days. And then afterwards, four days and 10 days, and four days and 10 days and four days. And I said, look, you can see the schedule and there's nothing wrong with us. And we're scheduled to go this place. So they, they let us go. That was very interesting. So the support for non-arrogance is the same thing. And so it was said without reference, what was this, what was uh, this said? How was this said? When a noble disciple considers I am practicing the way of abandoning and cutting off of those fetters. In other words, the 10 fetters, we, we talked about those. Um, okay, because of which I might be overly arrogant. A person will get arrogant. He says, maybe the person got to Sotapanna. And the next week they come in, they're like, I'm here. <laughs> Okay, I just want everyone to know I'm here. I should sit in the front row. No, near the teacher. <laughs> like, and we haven't seen much of this, but I've heard stories. And this is, this is where we're way out of alignment with what jhanas and attainments are. We're not demoting them. We are not slighting them by saying, we're just saying, get them in balance because your jhanas are basically your road signs down a noble path that is very clearly set up in order to reach the state of cessation, fall over, come out of it and experience Nibbana. They're road signs. And if you learn about it, there's nothing wrong with teaching a person what is between New York and San Francisco. As you're driving across the country, you will know that you got to Ohio and you got to the Illinois and you got to the next state and you were going across the country. If I don't tell you anything about it, you won't know you even got there. So is this kind of thing. I would blame myself. Uh, the wise, have been, having investigated, would censure me for this. And on the dissolution of the body after death, because of being so arrogant, an unhappy destination would be expected for me. But this arrogance in itself, a fetter uh, and a hindrance. And, and while the taints and vexation and fever might arise through arrogance, there are no taints vexation or fever for one who is not arrogant. So each one of these eight pieces, if you go in there and find them, you can, I didn't put them in your paper. I was doing this separately, okay? And you see what it is, and if you let it go, you, you get a better deal. <laughs> That's the way it works, okay? And so it is with reference to this that it was said with the support of non-arrogance, arrogance will be abandoned. So this is a form of right effort, isn't it? Because you see that you're being arrogant, you let go of the arrogance, you bring up non-arrogance and continue with that. So there's your four steps of your six R's. Didn't you like the four and six there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, four, the six steps in the four steps of right effort. Actually, the sixth R is a repeat do it again as necessary. It is the prescription from the doctor to use the medication only as needed. That's what the repeat step is, okay? It doesn't mean 
I should repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, and keep doing it all on every thought that comes up. It doesn't mean that. It just means if you're disturbed again, then, and you pull, you feel you've moved away, then you run the five steps again, okay? These eight things that lead to the cutting off of affairs and the noble one's discipline have now been expounded to you in detail. And but the cutting off of the affairs of the noble one's discipline has not yet been achieved entirely in all of the ways. Venerable sir, how is the cutting off of the affairs of the noble one's discipline arrived at entirely and in all ways? It would be good if you would teach me the Dhamma showing me how the cutting off of affairs of the noble one's discipline is achieved entirely and in all ways. Then listen to me, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, Patalia, the householder, replied. And the blessed one said this, now householder, now suppose that a dog was overcome by hunger and weakness and was waiting by the butcher's shop. And then a skilled butcher or his apprentice would toss the dog a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton of meatless bones that is just smeared with blood. What do you think, householder? Would the dog get rid of his hunger and weakness by gnawing on such a well-hacked and clean-hacked skeleton of meatless bones smeared with blood? No, venerable sir. And why is that? Because that was a skeleton of well-hacked, clean-hacked, meatless bones that was smeared with blood, and eventually the dog will just reap weariness and disappointment. And so too, householder, the noble disciple considers thus, the sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton by the blessed one. They provide much suffering and much despair. And while the danger in them is great, having seen this thus as it actually is, with proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity, and he develops an equanimity that is unified, based on unity, with one specific task, instead of uh, equanimity being uh, diversified, going here and there and everywhere, okay? Your equanimity is doing one particular task at a time, working on one particular piece of dismissing it from the eight pieces we were talking about a minute ago. Where clinging to the material things of the world will utterly cease without remainder. It takes you to a point where you can become a genuine minimalist. Do you know the term minimalist? A minimalist is a person who, you know, okay, we need a place to stay, and Deepa and I are hiking, so we find a way to put some branches up on a three piece tree and put a platform and lean a bunch of branches, cover it over with leaves and actually end up making a hut, you know? And we end up saying, We're, it's a minimalist. We don't need everything to live. We are, we are ready, we're, we're prepared for survival is basically what it's about. And this is what he's talking about where clinging to material things of the world boils down to is <laughs> forget about the AC, let's hope that the water is clean and have a bathroom. It doesn't matter if you can sit or not, you can figure that out. <laughs> I'm the one that takes a while to figure that out, but you can figure that out. But the point is, is it clean? And there's an old saying about if you live in a dirt floored hut, it doesn't mean you don't sweep every morning. You got it? You live in a dirt floored hut, but it doesn't mean you don't sweep it out every morning. The householder suppose, here's another one, uh, suppose there was a vulture, a heron, and a hawk who seized a piece of meat and flew away and then the vultures and the herons and hawks pursued it and pecked it and clawed it. 
What do you think, householder, if that vulture or heron or hawk does not quickly let go of that piece of meat, wouldn't it incur death and deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures have been compared to a piece of meat by the blessed one, and they provide much suffering and much despair because while the danger in them is great, having seen this, thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that's diversified based on diversity and develops an equanimity that is unified and based on unity, where clinging to the material thing of the world utterly ceases without remainder. It just isn't that important. It isn't that important. Householders suppose a man took a blazing grass torch and he went against the wind. What do you think, householder, if that man does not quickly let go of that blazing grass torch, wouldn't that blazing grass torch burn his hand or his arm or some other part of his body so that he might incur death and deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus, the sensual pleasures have been compared to a grass torch by the blessed one. They provide much suffering and much despair. While the danger of them is great, having seen this, thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and develops the equanimity that is unified and based on unity where clinging to the material things of the world utterly will cease without remainder. So too, householder, noble disciple considers thus, sensual, oops, I did that, I'm sorry. Um, householder, suppose there was a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height that was full of glowing coals within the flame without a flame or smoke then a man came who wanted to live and not to die and who wanted the pleasure and he recoiled from pain and two strong men seized him by both arms and dragged him towards the charcoal pit well what do you think householder would that man twist his body this way and that, and try to be released? Yes, venerable sir, and why is that? Because the man knows that he's going to fall into the charcoal pit and he would incur death and deadly suffering because of it. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers the sensual pleasures have been compared to a charcoal pit by the blessed one, for they provide much suffering and much despair and while the danger in them is great. Having seen this thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, he then avoids the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and develops equanimity that's unified based on unity. and he's clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without any more remainder. The householder suppose a man dreamt about lovely parks and lovely groves and lovely meadows and lovely lakes, and on waking he saw nothing of it. So too householder and noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures have been compared to a dream by the blessed one. They provide much suffering and despair, while the danger in them is great, having seen this as it actually is without proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that's diversified based on diversity, and he develops the equanimity that is unified based on unity, where 
A clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. Householders suppose a man borrowed goods on a loan. For instance, he took your fancy carriage and fine jeweled earrings and proceeded and surrounded by those borrowed goods, he went to the marketplace. And the people seeing him would say, that is a rich man. That is how the rich enjoy their wealth. And then the owners, whenever they saw him, would take back their things. What would you think, householder? Would that be enough for the man to become dejected? Yes, venerable sir. Why is that? Because the owners took back their things. And so too, householder and noble disciple would consider sensual pleasures have been compared to borrowed goods by the Buddha. And they provide much suffering and much despair while the danger in them is great. And having seen thus as it actually is in proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that's diversifying based on diversity he develops an equanimity that is unified based on unity. We're clinging to material things of the worldly, uh, of the of world will utterly cease without remainder. And householders suppose there was a dense grove not far from some village or town within which there was a tree laden with fruit but none of its fruit had fallen to the ground. And then a man came needing fruit and seeking fruit. He wandering in search of fruit, he entered the grove and saw the tree laden with fruit. And thereupon he thought, this tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit has fallen on the ground. I know how to climb a tree. So let me climb the tree. I'll eat as much fruit as I want and I'll fill my bag. And he did so. But then a second man came who was needing fruit and seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit and taking a sharp axe. He too entered the grove and he saw the tree laden with fruit. And thereupon he thought the tree is laden with fruit, but none of the fruit has fallen on the ground. I do not know how to climb a tree. So let me cut this tree down at its root and eat as much fruit as I want and fill my bag. And he did so. And what do you think, householder, if that first man who had climbed the tree doesn't come down quickly, when the tree falls, wouldn't he break his hand or foot or some other part of his body so that he might incur death and deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir. And so too, householder, a noble disciple, considering thus, the sensual pleasures have been compared to fruits on a tree by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair. And while the danger in them is great, having seen this thus as it actually is, with proper wisdom he avoids equanimity that is diversified based on diversity. And he develops the equanimity that is unified based on unity where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. So he's talking about the gradual development of the student who is letting go more and more in the process of the development of your meditation. It's not an urgent thing to have 15 pairs of shoes and 40 dresses and this kind of thing and to get down to basics and organize your life and structure it in a way for the, for the householder I'm speaking of. And for the monks, it's different. We, you know, when we become, when we go into the, uh, when I went into this, I had uh, a giveaway uh, because I knew the Native Americans did this and chose to have a giveaway, which in some Buddhist countries, they do this too. They leave the home and go to get ordained or they, uh, sometimes will they give everything away before they go to get ordained and take a new life. It's different. In the Native American tradition, when they changed your name because you did something, you, you changed from little fox into brave wolf. 
So all the toys and everything were given away and all your small clothes and all your moccasins and everything, your chair, small chair, everything. And then you became Brave Wolf. And then from there in your life, when you did the naming ceremony, you gave your old life away and took your new life. So it was like a refreshing, was a cleansing uh, to do this. And when we go into the monastic life, the monk can own three robes. That's it, three. And the woman is allowed to have five. That's my understanding. The nun is allowed to have five. And this is something I've always kept throughout the time that I've uh, been, you know, even in the level that I'm in, I adopted this whole system uh, because it's easier to have two shoes for two feet and one cup for one mouth and one spoon for eating and one bowl. It's just easy. And you can control the amount of food that you wanna eat if you use your bowl at home. If you're not walking alms, by marking the inside of your bowl and eating the same amount of food each day. So there's, there's all kinds of benefits to this and having one cup, nobody else is going to drink out of that. And you have one sieve to clean your water or to sift your food if you're cooking different ways. So householder, um, okay, based on this, uh, this is all describing in this sutta is describing how you will develop to a point of equanimity. This is an advanced sutta, but I'm gonna read you the next part, but it's not something most of us would get involved in. And it's something that you really should, most of it, the part about past lives is something you don't do unless you're with a teacher and unless you can maintain a fourth jhana level. And when I say reaching, it's one thing that's inconsequential with this, because when they're talking about this kind of balance of equanimity and uh, unified equanimity, they're talking about being able to do to mastering uh, determinations that I can sit just in one jhana for a whole day, just in the fourth, just in the third, and then shorter pieces. This is a, a skill training thing for the brain. And if you, you can learn to practice that way, your, your brain is getting sharper and sharper and sharper to do exactly what you wanted to do and go to a meeting and leave the meeting, come back to the drawing board and then go talk to your director and come back again. And it's so precise, your brain starts working in a very, you know, um, cubby hold way, like a post office box. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And so it's, it's a good kind of training. Also, um, it's the level of um, one of the tests for one of the levels in attainments is uh, can you sit down and one person says, okay, we're going to sit. We will sit for two hours. And it just goes, uh, and everybody sits for two hours. Nobody moves the muscle. And you come out right at two hours, just like that. And this, these kind of time frames is sharpening your mind to be able to do these things. If you dedicate yourself in that direction for a month or two to sharpen yourself up, you can learn to do this. And it really helps you to use it, work and things. So I'll read the rest of it now here and then we'll look at a few, a little bit of other things. Okay, uh, so on this one, based upon the uh, same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity, the noble disciple will decide, rec recollect his past lives. Now, there's many reasons for doing this, and one of them is the sharpness of your brain. Can it do it? Another reason that people do it is they might run into a bad habit they, they, that comes out when you're purifying your mind. Things will come up from someplace that doesn't have anything to do with this life. And when that comes up, you'll start having a particular kind of odd habit that you didn't have before and you don't want it, you can actually figure out where it came from. Uh, the sad part about today is there's so much of the sort of arrogance, pridefulness and show off type stuff that goes on in our world. That if people come in, they want you to teach them to do this, we will not train them if we know they're gonna do that because that's not what this is about. And there was too much of that in the last uh, 50 or 60 years that really was bad for Buddhism to do that kind of thing. And so, um, but 
privately monks still work on this and still learn how to do this kind of thing, okay? And uh, you can, uh, in 51, let's see, we look in that real quick, but I think it's just a tiny little, let's see what it is. When this concentrated mind is purified and bright and unblemished and rid of imperfections, it becomes malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. Imperturbability is a nice big word you can say you have now. <laughs> it means an undisturbable mind. It cannot be disturbed. He directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects, it recollects his manifold past lives uh, as one birth, two birth, three birth, four birth, five birth, 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, and all the way up to thousands of 100,000 births, one world, eons of world contraction, eons of world expansion, eons of world contraction and expansion. I'm not going to remember these properly, but I will explain to you what that piece means. Uh, this is when a person goes back uh, for uh, other reasons to do past life regressions and wants to really get detailed in what went on. There could be, a, actually we have somebody here who's really good at that, Brenda High. <laughs> she does that with people to help them go back and see for certain reasons, if something's bothering a person, there can be any number of reasons to go back and find this. Where did this come from? All of a sudden it's here in my life, you see? And sometimes you can release things and then it clears your mind and really makes things easier. And some people can do this. They can go back to a number of them. Sometimes if a phobia comes up in your life, you don't have to go back for that many lifetimes to understand it might just hit you this phobia doesn't have anything to do with this life here and now it was something to do with other times in another existence so why am i concerned about it i don't know why it came up but it doesn't have anything to do with me and then you can let it go sometimes that can happen that happened with me with fear of heights if i told you the story about cleaning off the rain gutter. That's what Bonte did with me. And it was only four or five lifetimes. And that was it. That's all I had to know. I didn't have to know details. I, I could see the person and I could tell the person was ready. I was there on the day it was going to happen. And I could watch how they died. And I, it, this had nothing to do with me. And once that clicked inside, it was not necessary to do anything anymore. Now, I know May has to leave in a couple of minutes, so I wanted to uh, just say that um, you get the feeling now uh, from listening to this, the um, Pataliya Sutta, you get the feeling that the way that you are keeping your precepts has a bearing on how your practice is going to go. And if you don't have any of these hindrances bothering you, and by the way, these hindrances are only five of them. And we can go to another sutta and find 11 and another sutta and find 16 or eight in another place. And those pieces are offshoots of these five. In other words, the five are up here. And then what we discovered, or what I, I've discovered with my students over in Malaysia, that was fun. We made a chart. And this is what I like about practicing uh, the way that we're practicing using the Brahma Viharas. So the chart is very simple. I'm going to show it to you very quickly. I can use my little do this and do this for you. Um, whoops, okay, there we go. And, um, and what happens is Okay, whoops, I did something strange. Okay, no, I don't want to do that. Here, here we go. Okay. Um, what it looks like is this. When you hear about the, uh, we practice metta, okay, metta, and we practice the karuna, when it comes, is you know, it blooms, this one leads to this one, this one leads to mudita, And this one leads to Upeka. Now, 
So it's loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, right? Okay. We have read that if you're practicing loving kindness, what you lose is ill will, thoughts of ill will. You abandon all thoughts of ill will. When karuna comes up, this one starts to cancel any thoughts of cruelty. And when the mudita comes up, when joy is coming into play, then you have no discontent. And when upeka comes in, this one is where aversion completely disappears. Now that's interesting. And now we look at the five, we see we had lust and greed. We had hatred and aversion. Uh, we had um, sloth and torpor. We had um, restlessness, guilt, remorse. Guilt, remorse. And then we had um, doubt. Doubt's over here on the end. <laughs> doubt. And we had a big chart we made of this. And what we did, um, well, let's see. There we go. <laughs> Here's your doubt. Oops, I didn't quite do that. Oops. And then what you do is you kind of play with this and you look and see these four are like seeds. You see, these guys are like seeds. And we think if we look at these, can you connect these, the five, to those four? And then if you go to Sutta number, you can do this yourself, go to Majima Nikaya number 128, and you take the 11 pieces there. There's 11, some of them, there's a couple of repetitions, but not very much. And you'll find a whole list of 11, 10 or 11 uh, that are hindrances in 128. And those are going to stem also back up to here into these see that's what i'm after i was trying to see connection and when we had this chart then we went somewhere else and we dug up the negative pieces in um well, i think you can look in two you can look in four you can look in uh, 128 uh, and i gave you guys a list i know if you came to retreat you got that list and you go and you find where they are, the other ones, and the idea is do all of these come back to these four? And it's very interesting because what I'm showing you is a secret that exists in 62, Majima Nikaya number 62, and that's the Maha Rahulavada Sutta. And what is the secret I'm talking about? Nobody, if you don't know about that sutta, you're really getting cheated out of understanding the hindrances very, very clearly because the Buddha thought that it was important enough for Rahula to stop his breathing meditation and master the Brahma Viharas, be not just do the breathing meditation. And the reason he told him to do that was because of section 18 to 21, uh, 18 to 20, yeah, 18 to 21, in 62. You go to Majima Nikai number 62 and you look section 18 to 21 and what he showed his son, this is what's important, to get rid of these four pieces. And if you get rid of these four pieces, it doesn't matter what you use as an object of meditation or the basic method is if it's going down the same path to go through the same levels, to reach cessation, experience Nibbana, you must get rid of these. So how are you going to get rid of them is to counter them and use something that destroys them. So all of these, if they're connected like this, 
to that, okay, if we teach you this, we're showing you how to get rid of the whole thing. And that's what he did. And that's an interesting sutta because it was not taught to a group of monks. This was a private session between the Buddha and his son when he was up there practicing breathing meditation, okay? So once again, when you look at the sutta, you look at the hindrances, okay? When we look at the, uh, the hindrances and these, these wonderful, yeah, here we go, try again. Oops, one minute. I can do it, I can. Of course, the bell's ringing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she <laughs> okay, I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> I have to just go for just a second to the door and I'll be right back. So I don't know how to make this big. Bonte, you have to tell me how to make it big again. I can't make it do, 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 do. That's somehow. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> Are you brought me that? I have a class. I'm going to shut the door and go. Okay? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, what, what you do is, I don't know how to do this. Can, I, well, there you go down. Now you go up, but I can't see everybody. It's really funny. I don't know. Stop. Stop the share. There. That was a simple message and I couldn't find it. <laughs> okay, so the objective here was to really get you to see that he's not going to come out and teach it in a single lesson. The message that you were hunting for was that if you break a hindrance, if you break a precept, I'm sorry, will a hindrance come up? Also, the hindrances, when you look on your chart, you're going to see that I put the hindrances there and I put the precepts opposite them. Don't get the wrong idea about this. I kept away from putting arrows that might make you think, you know, if I... Uh, if I have lust and greed, only one hindrance is going to come up. Hindrances can come one or two or three together to get you, to bother you. Um, you know, we use the example of two people driving home from work and one accidentally hit a dog on the way home. He felt bad and he lamented it. He was very sorry. In some cases, people stop and take the collar and try to find the owner, give it to the owner. Um, but he did the, the, the problem he had with hindrances after were, was minor because he took his, hindrance, his pre, uh, precepts again and he forgave himself for doing this. But the other man, he left the same time from the office as he, the, this man. And he was angry at his boss. He got in the car and he was angry driving and he was angry on the road and he saw a dog and he swerved over to hit it. And then he went home and he didn't do anything. Now, what the, this two of them, they hit a dog probably on the same curve. What is the, the action is almost kind of equal the way it the, happens, but the outcome is very different, isn't it? So why is the outcome different is because of intention. So when we look at karma properly, when we look at it properly, there's four pieces to it. We need to remember this, okay? There's first of all, there is this intention. The chetan is the intention of what I'm going to do. And, and kama just means action. The karma or kama just means action, okay? Now the mistake we make today is then we like to say we pocket is the result and we pocket is not the result, okay? And neither is the phone. Um, okay, I can't. <laughs> okay, hold on. Just, just you're gonna love this, right? Okay, hold. Um, Harry, I can't. I have to call you back. I'm in a class, okay? And I'll call you back, okay? Okay. Um, 
Okay, so, um, uh, right. The, the chaitana is the first step. The action is the second step that you, that you actually do the act. The third step is vipaka, which means fruit, fruition, not fruition, I'm sorry, ripening, the ripening. This is very interesting because over time, someone wrote me last week and said, what do you mean by slippages? As this is a good example. This is a very good example. If you go into the old wheel publications or find the old publications from the elder monks writing things from the early part of the century, the last century, you're going to find out they're talking about karma with four steps. But when you're talking to people now, a lot of books are writing three steps and they're forgetting and people don't understand what this means because of that. Chaitana is your intention. Kama is your action. And then you have a ripening period. When this ripens, the energy ripens, it comes back at you and that's your fruition. You can equate it to Deepa, you and I decide we're going to plant apple trees across India. So we get a bag of seeds. And our intention is to plant apple trees. And so we plant the seed. And then the tree has to grow and it has to get to the place where it blooms flowers and the little piece of fruit appears, but that's still not an apple, right? We can't pick that little tiny piece of fruit off until it ripens and then we get the fruit. So that's four steps. When we look at action, the actions that occur in your lifetime, some of these things do come around and they hit you from behind in your one lifetime. You ever do something in your 20s and now you're in your 50s? Maybe it comes around or 60s and it, it comes back at you, what you did. But then there are things that you could have done that don't come back to you, but, but make you life miserable and you don't know how all of this works and suffer a lot in this lifetime, but in an, another lifetime somewhere else, in another body, as a man or a woman, all of a sudden something starts happening in that lifetime where this energy flowed in the consciousness and gets picked up by another living being. And that's we're talking rebirth. We're not talking about reincarnation. That's another slippage that happened in this day and time with people walking around saying, oh, rebirth, reincarnation is the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. All right? It's not. So it's it's very interesting because a lot of the things got mixed up like right effort how did it slip away right effort is in the text it's written out over and over again in one paragraph and yet today you go and ask a established person what does right effort mean and they'll say it means to work really hard put your shoulder to the wheel you know really persevere, don't give up, be diligent. And that's not what right effort is in Buddhism. That is a regular kind of effort, but that's not the one that was in the Eightfold Path. The kind of they're talking about encompasses everything in life. Do you want to be a good student at school? Did you put right effort into it? Yes, you were diligent and you went to school and you worked hard and read your assignments and got high grades. You see? That existed, to learn to ride a bike, play tennis, ride a horse, anything you talk about, a race car, I don't care what it is. You have to put diligence and the stuff they're talking about into it. So that's an encompassing thing that's in all of life. But right effort was special. And it sat in the Eightfold Path in three spots, right beside mindfulness, the right, right effort, uh, right, con what is it? Mindfulness, uh, right effort, and then mindfulness, and then concentration. And these three pieces were obviously part of a practice system. And when we look at right effort closely, it was a, a solution for a wrong kind of habit and changing your behavior to the right habit by seeing the wrong one letting it go, bringing up the right one you want to establish and keeping it going. That's, your, that's what your R's are about. 
then that's what is this recognizing and then re release and relax smile come back. That's what it's about, okay? So I'm gonna open this to questions and ask, and, and ask, you know, let me know if I hit this well enough or if you still need more, but if you look at your pages, you're going to be able to find the rest of it in the sutta parts that I gave you. Did you, did you do that? Yeah? Okay. Anybody got a question? Ulysses. Yes, um, in the in the sutta, just this is just for clarification of what of how is written versus what we're supposed to get. Could you explain or expound on what equanimity that is diversified means, as opposed to equanimity that is unified? Yeah. Get your phone out and go to the dictionary on uh, Google. Try that. I hate this word, you know, because diversification is a great idea for looking at people equally. Diversification in absolutely everything doesn't make sense because if we just let everybody come in to be a ballerina, we won't have a skilled ballet company anymore. If we just let anybody come in to sing opera, it doesn't work anymore. We don't get good quality. So it's not just in the arts that are affected by this. The arts are spoiled to some degree because of this nowadays from what it used to be. But just go into your, um, your browser and pull up and just at Google is what I usually do. And let's see, that's right, Google will do it just fine. Google, right? Mm -hmm. And then define, define diversity. It's diversity, right? <laughs> it's a bad dictionary. You can't, you can't say, um, define diversity. Diversity. <laughs> See, this is a bad dictionary. The, diversity means the state of being diverse. Okay, what does diverse mean? Go ahead, look up diverse. D-I-V-E-R-S-E. Um, Okay, there was a considerable diversity in the style of the reports is the, is the thing. So a diversity of it is different ways of looking at everything. Now, I'll show you what happened in Buddhism with this word. Um, uh, gee. Okay, here's what happens. You wanna let everybody who has a school and a sect and says they have a tradition or a method of doing Buddhist meditation to come in and say it's Buddhist meditation. But it isn't based on what the Buddhist said if it isn't coming from where, that's why I said it's better to say Buddha Dhamma is what we're working on specifically, I think, rather than saying Buddhism, because it, it, Buddhism goes in all these directions, do you understand? It's so incredibly diversified now you can barely find out what it actually was when you say Buddha Dhamma. But where is the Buddha Dhamma in this, this one or this one or this one? And then the way I do it, this is me, our whole system is based on does it operate and does it carry you down the path and allow you to have the experience and you feel this opening that is described in the text and the side effects are there and what comes after is happening or not. So that's what we're after. We're, we're looking for that. That's the only way I, there must be a shorter way of saying that. But then you say here, um, see now newspapers were obliged to allow a diversity of views printed. And a lot of this is affected now by politically correct speech. When you go to your dictionaries, it's trickled over. So the newest dictionaries printed. I don't know the dates on the newest dictionaries. I used to follow the dictionaries really hard. Let me see what um, we can find some other words. This is a favorite book of mine, okay? So this is a thesaurus. So if we go and we look up diversity and see what happens if we look here for diversity in a, in a synonym book, then it's more fun because you can find other words that mean the same thing. Here you go. 
It is here, okay. <laughs> Diversity, <clears throat> it's varied, the variegate, assorted, mixed, altered, changed, transformed, or expanded, you see? And diverse as an adjective would mean um, assorted, mixed, variegated, here to heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous, heterogeneous, right? Uh, different, differing, unlike, dissimilar, distincting, contrasting, conflicting. See? Do you see how far away you can get from the practice when you do that? <laughs> Unless you go back into the book specifically. So if you're talking here about the word diversity was in, um, what were we in? 54, was it 54, right? 54. And it was in every single statement, equanimity that's diversified based on diversity, okay? So it's diversified equanimity that's spread out, okay? And what he's saying is the only way you can go down the path is if you have an equanimity that is unified based on unity. Unity with what? Unity with purpose and direction with the path. You see, that's the way you would look at that. You get it? Okay. Yes, yes. and I, I guess the, the, the reason why it was difficult to grasp is because I, I, I didn't see how the word equanimity would work in the diversified field, you know, like how- Do you how remember, the, okay, do you remember the chart that I gave you and one of the pieces on the chart that I let you guys see, the one that I built that was the half moon? Do you remember that, that's the diversification of equanimity on one of those lines. And it, it's, it's a gradual development from the beginning, the very beginning of equanimity, from just sitting still and being calm, all the way into the first, second, third, fourth level of equanimity, down through the mental states into disenchantment, and then into um, dispassion, and then into imperturbability absolute level of equanimity the highest level is imperturbability there's nothing you can do to disturb the person's mind they just say okay that happened now that's past what do we do next <laughs> that's about all that happens i mean like we blew a tire i remember we were crossing country in a uh, like a mobile thing for Bonte to live in one time we had this uh, vehicle and the tire blew and it blew a hole right in the wall where the bathroom was in this vehicle. It was a big mess. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, when it happened, uh, we both just were really calm going cross country with that drive. And we both looked at each other and said, okay, well, that's, that was interesting. That's over. <laughs> Another example is going into town and coming back when somebody calls uh, and says, you know, we've been hit, you need to come back right now. And my question was hit with what we got hit by the storm, but you didn't say what the storm was. And when we got back, we pulled up to the gate and looked in on the property. And um, there were six oak trees that were 80 feet high that were gone, you know, and half of a house that had been sucked off the ground and taken away. And, and we just looked at it <laughs> and he said, well, that's different. And I said, he said, what's in your mind? And I said, what immediately came to me was we don't have to raise money to tear down the house now. <laughs> it's in another county. It went away. You know, it flew away. So the diversif diversification is this idea, and this is a good... Uh, it's a strange word. I don't. I should have more discussion with you about this, with what you're doing in your work, Ulysses, because you're in a place where diversification is very vitally important. But if you pin one of those people down and ask them to explain what is diversification, they can't explain it. They can't explain why you're going to have peace through diversification. Now, see, accepting all groups, that's one thing, but by setting up what this one has to want absolute, that one wants absolute, that one wants absolute, that one wants absolute, is, is what can totally tear a country apart, and you're watching it happen. You're watching it happen with what's going on with that, you see? 
really crazy. There should be some way to realign everybody. Like maybe we should give them all, um, I don't know, give them all something so everybody's calm and nobody's going to call anybody any names and nobody's going to be rude. And then we can come up with a balancing bar. And somehow there has to be a way to do that. But he, this, I think this, you could probably take this statement in the Sutta Ulysses where it says he avoids the equanimity that is diversified. When you're going to, um, oh, I just had it and it just left. It went in one, one side of my head and went out the other. Um, to try to go down through the path with a diversified approach is fruitless. The Buddha tells Vacha that, doesn't he, in 72. Remember, we went to 72? Do you remember that? In 72, he explains to Vacha, he simply cannot do, understand what he's teaching um, because if you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve another teaching, pursue a different training, follow a different teacher, you can't understand what I'm trying to teach. That's what the Buddha was telling him in section 18 of 72. That's what he was saying. So this is why when we had a conference once, peace through, diverse, through diversity, peace through diversity, and I spent three years trying to figure out what that meant. And I really was trying to put the benefit of my doubt out there to see what it must mean something. The UN is using it. This big conference for all of Buddhism was using it. And yet the people weren't working together, weren't sharing and weren't, you know, what did it really mean? And so the question with that operation was what were they really doing? you know, over the whole thing. So, I don't know. Another question, anybody? Deepa, I yeah? got a question on email. Huh? Yes, I okay. got a question on email, which is... Okay. Uh, okay. Can you go hear? Ahead. Monty, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I am using PIM uh, as the framework, forgiveness as object of meditation, coupled with a simple form of pranic healing to overcome the knee-jerk tendencies. Sister Kema suggested, results are great. May I know where in the text I can find out more about forgiveness as a healing mechanism for mm -hmm. all forms of physical and mental illness, including cancer? Uh, that takes a bit of, you know, in the text itself. I haven't in, in the Majima Nikaya. This is one of the pieces where when he's explaining, when he's teaching you something and an offshoot comes and someone actually said to me one time, Bhante, um, why are you teaching forgiveness? There's no forgiveness taught in Buddhism. And I said, wait a second, every night at the temple in Malaysia, we have a ceremony. And in that ceremony, I don't know what I did with it. In that ceremony, okay, you tell me what that means. What does that mean? What does it mean? Thought, uh, speech, and uh, body reaction. If I have done anything with thought, body, speech, or action, please forgive me, Bhante. So that means if you're a good Buddhist, you're going... That is what... This yeah, for your eat, for the end of the day. It's not in the morning, is it? It's only in the evening that one is there. Is that right? There is also a Vinaya where uh, monks, when they, they are leaving, they can leave, they take, uh, ask for forgiveness. Is that Pawarana or different? The Pawarana is just at the Katina? Yeah, Pawarana is, I, I, I'm not exactly sure the uh, Pali name, but uh, this is what we do a forgiveness thing. And at the end of the retreats, which are uh, done on uh, Bhante's retreat, is the same. Uh, here you go. 
Kaye na wachichitena palmadena mayakatam. Ache yung kalma me bante buri panya tatagata. If by deeds, speech, and thoughts, heedlessness, if, it, if by my deeds, speech, or thought, heedlessly I have done anything wrong, forgive me, O Master, O Teacher, most wise. This is the equivalent of a confessional in the Catholic Church on Saturday. This is kind of what is there happening for you and for sangha also supposedly this is used on a daily basis and what it's saying is if you have broken a precept then you're taking your precepts again you're getting back on track and you keep going in your life you do not carry the burden of this the idea of um of the the burden of what was done wrong you do not carry upon you in your life as a heavy thing because it's past. And you try to learn to stay within the present time as the only weight upon you. And so it's easier to be happy if you have this much. But when you have your back filled with stuff from the past, you're carrying around with you. And then you put another spare pack on front of you to worry about what might happen next. Those little tiny packs, you know, that you can hang on front of you. And then try to walk. You're walking like this. It's pulling you down and weighting you back. You can't even walk straight, you see? So the Buddha says, stand up straight. Take those packs and leave them at home. Leave them at home and go to work. Pretend to take this off and put it down. Take this one off, put it down. Now go to work and stay in the present time, and that's all you have to do. The weight of that cannot be that heavy, see? It allows you to have the space to smile. One so, more question. Mm -hmm, um, yep. The second question. Uh, can we use the phrase from Majjima Nikaya 148, Chachaka Sutta, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, in overcoming hindrances, for example, when discomfort, tension, and tightness arises, that we have difficulty re, uh, releasing and relaxing. I have tried a combination of rolling the R's with this phrase and the discomfort. No, no, and no, and I think I know who this is. I don't remember, but they wrote me. I told them, do not stop. Do not say these phrases. That is not something to be done in a practice. This is somebody who wants to make the six steps. One, two, three, wait a second, four. Hold on, I got to check for tension from here to my toes and back again. Five, six. Okay, I can come back now to my meditation. To do anything, it should be like this. To do anything such as that, to step away from those six R's and do anything outside, such as what you just described, saying a phrase, or adopting a scanning technique and then coming back. You want to know what that is? That's two different meditations you're doing. So when I ask you to sit for 30 minutes, and if something comes up, run your six R's, that's okay. But if you sit for 30 minutes and after five, you go over here and do a scan for five minutes and, or three minutes and come back and then reset yourself and then start again. No, that's two different meditations you are attempting to do. Don't do this, it's not necessary. What you're missing, the, the reason it's happening is because I personally need to control this and make it happen. And no, you don't. The lesson here is to surrender to the command center. Surrender to, if I let go in my mind, relax my head, smile and come back, the rest of the body will follow. The point of your practice is to learn uh, to have these things happening automatically. And it is imperative you get the six R's in two or three seconds. It's very fast. You see? One, one part of the question is, can we use this phrase as an object of meditation? This I would say no. Not if you're doing twim. And Bonte would say no too, because I discussed that with him. I think he was here when that question came up. 
And we said, no, you don't do that. Now, what you can do that is very healthy is what he told his own monks to do. If you go back into this uh, 148 and look at what that was, he was describing something for his monks to do the next morning. He was describing for them, so in these, these uh, 148, very distinctly, the uh, de demonstration of not self is to be practiced by the monk. The monk is to go out the next day and recite this and walk with it. If anyone says the eye is self, that is not acceptable. That is uh, the rise and fall of the eye is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it's not acceptable for anyone to say the eye is self, therefore the I is not self. You should take this whole section, the section of demonstration of self, and then you walk around again with the origination of identity to find out how did it happen? How did they get like that? How did we find ourselves in that position? One regarded the I that it wrong. That's what you grew up with. Now turn the page. The last part of your, your exercise this morning when you go out and now you're walking back is, and this is the way leading to the cessation of this identity. He's giving them a drill, literally, for them to go out in the forest and use it with their walking and learn it by heart and drill it into the mind. One regards the I thus. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. One regards uh, the forms thus, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. You see that? Yeah, you see? So you take this and write it down. I took it, I wrote it down, I walked all over the property with it. I walked out to where I was gonna work for the day in the forest. I was saying it all the way out there. Um, and then if I took a break, I would sit there and just do it for a while. And then I would walk down the mountain to lunch and say the next one. And after that, I would say the next one. And then I would go to take a nap. See, that's what we did with it. It's actually physically a drill that he gave those monks. It's so clear. Go and read it. So should See? we do it or not? That is the question. Should we, then uh, you are saying that you are taking that as an uh, object of meditation. No. If you are saying Take that you it are as a form of walking meditation to drill the mind to believe this as much as possible, but don't spoil your meditation practice by trying to insert this in the process of your six R's. No, no. Question. The second question is uh, taking this as an object of meditation. So you can take it as an object of meditation for walking. Or only walking? I would recommend it because yeah. you know the other thing you want to get your mind to give up is um, repetition, 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 repetition of, of um, may I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy sort of thing. You don't want your mind to rely, you don't want to rely on that. You can, if you want to sit and do it in one spot, I suppose you could, but you need to tell me what happens. The point is, don't let it into your meditation okay. itself. Don't do that. Because what's happening is, it's going to make it happen as part of your meditation. It won't permit you to develop and slide and start going down the road. It won't. It'll stop you. Okay. That is yeah. the word. That question is the word. Okay. Think, Anybody else? There's more than one and a half hours. Is okay. One yeah, anybody, anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Sister, uh, deep, deep, yes. Okay, Deepa? So, yes, uh, this is about the uh, what you drew on the board today. Yeah. Um, the, the four seeds uh, of, you know, the unwholesome seeds uh, to counter which we practice the Brahma Viharas. Uh, yeah. In that, the, the seed of ill will, we, we use metta to counter that. And then there is aversion um, and the countering is equanimity. That's how you drew it. Uh, yeah. But isn't ill will and aversion almost the same? No. Uh, no. What would be the difference? Um, 
Ill will, you're planning something to do something to someone else, to, to another person. Aversion is, I don't want to do this. That job might be available, but I don't want it. I've got aversion to it. Or so, Uncle Harry is coming and you can't stand being around him. I have total aversion to being in the room with Uncle Harry at Christmas time. <laughs> you, see, you don't, the aversion, aversion pushing. Ill will is you want to do something to people that thoughts of ill will. The way it's written in the text is abandoning of thoughts of ill will toward another person, right? You have ill will. The other one, ill will and uh, cruelty is the thoughts of actual cruelty towards someone, torturing them, killing them slowly in, in things like that. That's, or torturing someone another way mentally. Thoughts of cruelty is to torture a person cru uh, cruelly. Uh, mentally is to, um, a uh, we say verbal, mental and verbal abuse in a situation with an elder or a young person, e either direction can happen, you see? And that's a, and, that's a form of cruelty. And discontent would be, uh, would, would be like jealousy and envy, those kind of things? Uh, no, just discontent is like, I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with that. I'm not happy with anything. Nothing the person can do for you in a relationship will make you happy. Have you ever met somebody like that? Or somebody that no matter what you do, you cannot please them. They are discontent with everything. There's an upsetting wave of energy inside them of discontent. You see? Yeah. And, the, um, uh, and discontent... Um, do you ever, did you ever, did you ever have somebody give you a present and you were really happy, you know, and when you're really happy receiving something, it's hard to be discontent about anything in the room you d or anything with anybody or anything because you're so happy. You see what's happening? It's a sigh. So let's see what discontent, just sign with my little dictionary here. I don't really like this dictionary, but we'll try again. Let's see. T fine. How they put it. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> define. Uh, no, they don't define any discontent. <laughs> so let's see. Let's see if it's in here. Sometimes they're in here. And, um, yeah, okay, I bet you it's here because, let's see, there's a lot of disses here. Not, not content. Discontent means not content. Um, so if we go to discontent, discount. Here you go. Okay, somebody is discontented. They're dissatisfied, they're just fed up with what's going on. They're restless, impatient, fretful, complaining, displeased, disgruntled, querulous, unhappy, miserable, wretched, envious. Envious, there's your jealousy, envious. So discontented with a situation to the point of being envious of it and jealousy are kissing cousins, okay? Regretful disaffected, exasperated, irritated, chagrined, annoyed, peeved off, peaked, <laughs> and, and so forth. There's another one in here I don't want to repeat. Okay. <laughs> but these little books are great. I mean, they're more useful to English as a second language. If you're a writer, these are worth much more than a dictionary because this teaches you how to not Repeat the same word when you're writing things over and over again. You, it, you know, if you're like me, not a big vocabulary. <laughs> so I just didn't spend it. So is there another word? Was there another word too? Or just that word? That word? It's that, yeah. So as you progress through your Brahma Vihara practice, what you are eventually left with is letting go of all kinds of aversions that come up. Sure. You're letting go of, um, 
any uh, over, overbearing uh, lust and greed to have things and any hatred and aversion towards anything, okay? And you are, um, uh, the hatred and aversion is the ill will and cruelty in that category. See, so they're all related when you draw those words out. You know, it's amazing. Um, the trouble with that diagram I did for you is that when I did it originally, I did it on a big white board and I never did it on the computer. And it's too bad because, you know, you can play the game of putting them all on there with the ones at the top, the four of them at the top. And we feel like we uncovered, my students felt like they uncovered a secret. You know, that if we, if we have loving kindness, uh, co compassion, uh, the joy and equanimity, the balance of things, which is like, just never mind, let it go. Anicca, it's going to go past, you see? It's, that's where the Anicca connects into this. Um, but if you put them on the top of the board and you write everything else you can find in the book on the board, then you start drawing lines and just asking people which one at the top is this connected to and they all sort of go in. And the five of them are connected to those four at the top. And the same way you can draw a line to there, the, the four of them, okay? so. We just, I just feel like he had the meeting with his son was the time when he did that with his son, 62, uh, he was getting ready to go off and teach on his own. That's when that was happening, when he was about 17. And so um, knowing that, it's just like he wanted to give him an edge, you know, to protect himself when he left. And of course it got preserved, but he was 18 years old when that one was happening, okay, that sutta. And so um, by teach going over the elements with him and how to use the elements in meditation and then showing him the importance of the Brahma Viharas. And the reason we say the Brahma Viharas are so important is because for the lay person, these Brahma Viharas are very usable all the time. You've already found out that. You know with how much you see and so the average person you can talk to anybody from any religion about these um, four pieces of loving kindness and compassion and joy and balance of mind you can talk to anybody and then you can teach them just never mind when you start to get your blood pressure up just never mind because it's going to pass and everything passes and if somebody's really upset you ask them sometime, have you ever had anything happen that didn't go past? And they'll sit there and say, no. Well, then why are we still talking about this? And it happened 10 years ago and it's still upsetting you. Is it making any sense? Well, I'm, I'm reliving the emotion. And then you show them the line. You show them the, the balancing line of the past, the future, and the present time. And you ask them the questions, what is the past, what is the future, and look at the present time. It isn't agitated, it isn't heavy, it's not a burden. And so the present time is where I want to live. Yeah? Okay? So this is like, we can't say happiness is such an interesting thing because you could do a whole talk on happiness. And it's elusive people think it's elusive and they want to catch it they want to grab it they want to have it and put it into a box it's like the answer to nibbana I, we need the immediate gratification give me the answer tonight for ha about uh getting to nibbana <laughs> okay well it's the same thing with happiness but you can't have it in a box why because it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes so how do we treat it? How do you treat a river when you go down a river in a canoe? Do you fight the rapids or do you live the rapids? Do you go with the flow through the rapids to make it to the bottom of the run, you see? And you can't fight it. Just the way the story of the ocean, you cannot fight with the whirlpool, you will drown, you see? or the undertow, 
and you want to swim back to your mom. No, you go with the current and towards the beach and get out and walk back to mom. <laughs> okay. All right, we need to cut this off. Everybody happy? Yeah. Any other questions? Any questions? Okay. Here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.